For my thoughts on all the latest happenings in the NFL in a completely relaxed, unscripted format, be sure to check out my channel, JG9 News. And now, on with our feature presentation. How do people enjoy their football Sundays? Well, there are quite a few people that will not listen to the game with the play-by-play -play announcers on their television screens. There is an entire group of people that will tune in every Sunday and not listen to the likes of Jim Nance and Tony Romo or the likes of Ian Eagle and Charles Davis. Instead, they'll listen to this little thing called the radio. You may have heard of it. Listening to games on the radio is something that many fans do, either because they're not able to be by their television sets, or because they have some sort of vision problem, and the radio broadcast does a better job explaining what's going on to them than the television broadcast does. And this is more applicable in baseball than football, but there are some people that love their radio team so much that they'll mute the television and sync the radio broadcast up with their TV so they can listen to their radio team while watching the game. There are many reasons why people might prefer a radio broadcast over a television broadcast, such as the quality of the commentators and the topics that the commentators will talk about. Whereas a national broadcast with national commentators has to be neutral, the radio broadcasts are team-specific, so you're only hearing the things that you want to care about, and the announcers know more and are capturing the spirit of the fan base better than national commentators, who might only work one or two of your team's games all season. In other words, listening to the radio or alternate broadcasts to get your football fix isn't anything that's going away anytime soon. And speaking of not going away anytime soon, we're just getting started over here as we post every single day about the weird and wacky history of the NFL. So if you like that sort of stuff, be sure to hit that like button down below, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss a single video that we post on the channel. Thanks in advance for your support as we are so close to hitting 60,000 subscribers. But today, during this game right here that you've been watching this whole time, we've got quite the radio controversy for you. Because during a 2000 game between the Minnesota Vikings and the New England Patriots, just as we were starting to navigate and understand the World Wide Web and everything that was the internet, we had a bizarre controversy regarding a broadcast of the game that deserves a deep dive nearly a quarter century later, where the Patriots denied the Vikings the opportunity to broadcast the Patriots-Vikings game. The real story from this game wasn't what happened on the field, but rather, what happened off of it. And we're taking a look at that today. Because this is the story behind one of the craziest broadcast controversies of the entire 2000 NFL season. Before I talk about the actual incident in question and the bizarre controversy from a broadcasting perspective, we need some context to understand not just the importance of this game, but how the game itself was going. It's September 17th, 2000, it's week three of the NFL season, and we've got an interconference game on our hands over at Foxborough Stadium between the Minnesota Vikings and the New England Patriots. This is a battle between two teams starting their season in two very different ways. For the Vikings, they enter without a blemish to their record, starting the season 2-0, following wins against the Chicago Bears and the Miami Dolphins. While for the Patriots, they enter this game with nothing but blemishes, starting the season 0-2 with close losses to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the New York Jets. For the Patriots, this game felt like a must-win, seeing as excluding the strike short in 1982 season, only four teams in NFL history by this point made it to the playoffs after starting 0-3. If you get to 1-2, you put yourself back in the thick of things, but if you lose each of your first three games, you give yourself no room for error the rest of the way, and your season is just about over before it even began. And for the Vikings, well, let's just say that you've got an incredible chance at making the playoffs if you start a season 3-0. I think that goes without saying. And the good news for the Vikings was that during this game right here, they prevailed. It wasn't always the prettiest, and the Vikings didn't score a single point in the second half, but it didn't matter because when all was said and done, the Vikings won the game by a final score of 21-13. to 
Minnesota scored a touchdown on each of their first three drives of the game and never looked back. And slowly but surely, churn time off the clock and worked their way down the field throughout the contest. As the Vikings had three drives go for at least 12 plays, with their first two drives of the game resulting in a combined 33 plays. Minnesota dominated the time of possession, holding onto the ball for roughly 40 minutes, and they were super efficient on third down, converting 10 out of 17 opportunities, or 59%. And when Minnesota's defense needed to make a stand, they did, as on multiple occasions, they stopped the Patriots on fourth down in the red zone. Again, it was not a pretty game by any means, as things were definitely a bit sloppy after Minnesota's first three drives. But the Vikings got the job done, and that's all that matters. And if you wanted to stay tuned to the action as a Vikings fan, and wanted to experience your team winning this game to keep their undefeated season alive, there were quite a few ways to do it. Option one was, as you might have been able to tell based on everything you've been watching this entire time, watching the game on TV. Option two was to listen to the game on the radio, listening on WCCO AM, the official radio station of the Minnesota Vikings. But because this was 2000, and we were starting to progress from a technological standpoint, there was a third option, and that was the internet. Because the Vikings had a genius idea back in 2000, to produce a webcast of all the games, and have a separate broadcast online where you could listen to the game. Obviously, you couldn't watch the game, but if you didn't have Sunday Ticket, and you couldn't listen to the game because WCCOAM was outside your territory, and the signal wasn't strong, then you could listen to the game anywhere in the country as long as you had reliable internet access. Today, plenty of teams have webcasts, but back in 2000, this was sort of revolutionary, and the Vikings were, quite literally, the first team to do this, so they were entering uncharted territory. So the Vikings figured that they'd be able to do this webcast from Foxborough Stadium without any issue. They figured that this would go off without a hitch, just like every other webcast they had done thus far. Well, not quite. Because the Patriots had massive issues with this, because this webcast violated the exclusive rights of WBCN-FM, as in, the rights holder for the Patriots on the radio. According to the contract that WBCN-FM had with the Patriots, no audio can compete within a six-state New England region, and because of this, the Vikings would not be permitted to do their webcast inside Foxborough Stadium. In the eyes of the Patriots, a local radio broadcast would lose ratings and would lose an audience if a competing team had a webcast, as these were, apparently, the same exact thing. This wasn't apples and oranges. In the eyes of the Patriots, this was apples and apples. And let's think about this for more than five seconds, and why this ban on the webcast made no sense whatsoever. This isn't a radio broadcast. This is an internet broadcast. What is the primary audience of people who listen to an internet broadcast? Simple. It's people who don't have access to the game. You go by your computer, and you listen to the game because your radio station doesn't pick it up, and because you can't watch it on television. No one's listening to the webcast in their car, or their phone, or anything like that. Not back in 2000, at least. In 2000, there was a very specific set of people who would listen to the webcast, which was basically an alternate broadcast. So let's think about this. Who on earth would even listen to the webcast in the New England area? How would this be competing with anything? If the primary audience for a webcast is people at home, guess what? Every home in the New England area, because the game wasn't flagged out, would be getting the Patriots-Vikings game. Look, there were times growing up before we got Sunday Ticket that I had to listen to Jags games on the radio. But when the Jags were on TV, guess what? I didn't listen to the radio broadcast. I watched it on TV. And everyone in the New England area was going to do that here. The webcast fills a very specific need that wouldn't be applicable here. It would not be competition. And even then, and even if someone wanted to listen at home versus watching the game on TV, either for superstitious reasons 
or for vision reasons or anything else, guess what? The Vikings webcast is themed toward the Minnesota Vikings. In the New England area, are more people Vikings fans or Patriots fans? Do more people like a random team in Minnesota or their local team? I'm going to take a wild guess and say that they like their local team. So people in the area, if they have to listen, are going to listen to the radio broadcast from their local team that talks about their local team and that they're accustomed to listening to for so long. Think of it like preseason broadcasts. You much rather watch your local broadcast than the broadcast of the visiting team where all they talk about is the opposing team. No one, not a single soul in the New England area would be listening to this game on the freaking Vikings webcast. The Patriots are creating a problem with the Vikings here that quite simply does not exist. No one in those six states is a Viking fan who would be at home but not watch the game on TV and would think that the webcast is their best way to tune in. Especially at a time where just 42% of homes in the United States even had internet access in the first place and when many people still had dial-up internet. It's almost like the NFL being worried about losing viewership to the Super Bowl because of a Tom Grossi broadcast of the game. Like, those are two completely separate things for two completely separate audiences. And no one is missing the Super Bowl to watch Grossi's broadcast of the Super Bowl where he doesn't show the game. And even despite all of that, the Vikings were more than willing to compromise on the matter. If this was such a big deal to the Patriots, fine. We'll black out our webcast to any states in that six-state New England region. And this was at a time where VPNs did not exist, so there was no way to circumvent that. If you were that worried about this Vikings webcast taking listeners away from your radio broadcast, we'll black out the game in those territories. And on top of that, we'll even have pop-up notices throughout the game reminding people to tune into WBCN to listen to the action. It's insane that it had to come to that point, but it seems like a pretty fair compromise. If you were in that six-state region and you wanted to listen to the game without watching it, you had to do it via WBCN. Even if you were one of the zero people in the region who would have contemplated tuning into the Vikings webcast. And still, the Patriots denied that request. The Patriots said, tough luck. You're not doing your webcast from Foxborough Stadium. If you want to do your webcast, obviously we can't stop you. But it sure as heck not going to be at our stadium. You're going to have to do it at a completely separate location off of a television screen. And let's just put it like this. Calling a game off a TV screen is a heck of a lot different than calling a game in person. And not in a good way. There's a reason why the NFL in 2020 mandated that all announcers were in person for the games and they couldn't call games remotely from home. The experience is completely different and you can tell when an announcer is in person versus somewhere in a studio. TV angles don't always tell the full story and how you broadcast a game on television is very different than how you broadcast a game for an audience that can't see what's happening and is reliant on your words and your words alone. A TV broadcast is about showing, not telling. And a broadcast like a webcast is the exact opposite. When you're relying on a TV screen to call the action, and when you're relying on a director cutting to the right shots, especially when that director is not even in your ear because it's a completely separate company and completely separate thing trying to accomplish something completely different, it's brutal. There's no other way to say it. It's absolutely brutal. As an example, a key part of webcasts and radio broadcasts and the like is the play-by-play -play man saying who the receivers are from left to right on the screen. On a TV broadcast, however, you might see a close-up of the snap and might not even see the 11 guys on the field until after the ball is snapped. It's a completely different experience and a completely different way of calling the game. And it was going to make life for the Vikings webcast crew a living nightmare. And to say that the Vikings were livid about this would be putting it lightly, with Executive Vice President Mike Kelly saying on the matter, We think the internet broadcast is supposed to be different from a regular radio broadcast. 
we don't perceive it as a threat to the Patriots radio coverage. We don't even see our internet broadcast as a threat to our own radio broadcast. So it's interesting that they would see our internet as a threat to their radio. And yeah, that makes a ton of sense. These are two different audiences. An internet broadcast is going to be accessed by a completely different crowd than a radio broadcast, let alone an internet broadcast for the opposing team that's blacked out regionally. But there was nothing that the Vikings could do about it. The Patriots drew their line in the sand, the NFL didn't want to get involved, and the Vikings were absolutely screwed here as a result. There are certain stories like the one involving these two teams behind me right here that seem insane in 2024 with the benefit of hindsight. And I think we can all agree that this is one of those stories. The difference between a radio broadcast for a home team and a webcast for a road team, especially with the webcast being blocked in the markets of the home team, if that's what the Patriots really wanted the Vikings to do, is like night and day in terms of who can access it, in terms of who it appeals to, in terms of everything, a home radio broadcast and a road webcast that's blocked regionally, night and day, night and day. But obviously the Patriots didn't seem to think that way. In 2000, this decision was clearly made by some old heads who do nothing about technology, who do nothing about the internet, and who didn't understand any of the nuance between the two things. Because if they did understand the nuance, I bet that this decision would not be made. It seemed like everything was going great for the Minnesota Vikings during this game right here. They went on the road, they got the win, they kept their undefeated season alive, and they played extremely well offensively. You can't really ask for much more than that. But while everything on the field was going swimmingly, off the field was a different issue. Especially when it came to their webcast and their innovation that was, apparently, too ahead of its time for the Patriots. We can debate whether the Patriots were in the right or not for this. And we can debate whether a radio broadcast for the home team and an exclusive broadcast on the web for the visiting team that is whacked out in every market that picks up the home team's radio broadcast are the same thing. But in the eyes of the Patriots, in 2000, they were. And that's all that matters. Because on this September day in 2000, simply put, the Patriots told the Vikings to log off. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.